Hi guys, welcome to the Northern Venues Roundtable. So this session is just going to be um, discussing what it's like to run Northern Music Venues. Um, so we've got a great selection of people here who have plenty of stories to tell, and I'll pass you over. Great, hi everyone. Um, my name is Lucy Scott, I'm gonna be the chair today. Um, as Cara just said, this is the Northern Venues panel. So thank you for joining us. Um, We've got a really, really strong panel today. Some of you might know some of them, um, but I'm gonna let them introduce themselves in a minute. Uh, but first I'll just say um, what we're gonna do in the panel. We're just gonna be sort of, I'll ask some questions, and then at the end I'll kind of open it up for you to ask your questions to the panel. Um, so I'll start by introducing myself. Um, I'm Lucy Scott. I work for a venue in the northeast of England called The Glass House. <coughs> you might not have heard of The Glass House yet. Um, We've just recently rebranded. We were until very recently called Sage Gateshead, um, but a big arena was um, started being built next door, and uh, they decided they were going to be called the Sage. So to avoid confusion, um, we it was necessary for us to change our name. But it, uh, we've kind of embraced it as like a sort of new start, fresh beginning, um, you know, and in a direction that we're wanting to go in, um, sort of since COVID. So my role there, I programmed two venues, um, so Sage 1, which is 1,695 capacity, and Sage 2, which is 550, so very different scales. Um, and we sort of showcase all kinds of genres there, from jazz, folk, rock, pop, electronic, hip hop. So, um, and we also have a brilliant group of young programmers, one of whom is here today, um, who work with us to kind of help us build young audiences for the venue. That's enough about me. I'm going to pass over now and ask our wonderful panelists to introduce themselves. Um, if you would mind, just tell us a little bit about yourselves, about your venue, and the kind of music you program and what you do. I'll start with you, Craig. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Craig Pennington. I'm a chief exec, co-founder at Future Yard. We're a community music venue in Birkenhead on the sunny side of the River Mersey. Just looking over from the other, other side of the water from Liverpool. Um, first of all, um, it's always been back in Leeds. I lived and went to Union Leeds, lived in Leeds for eight years. Um, I started Dead Young Records and the Rock and Roll Circus normally, if anyone knows that. So um, lovely to come back, reassuringly still pouring down that the, the Fuzzy team are doing a little bit better now than they were when I, when I, when I left. Um, so yeah, we run uh, Future Yards, which is a community music venue, as I said, in, in Birkenhead. Um, we <laughs> program a whole range of, of artists across kind of you know new amazing contemporary alternative music electronic a bit of classical jazz and everything in between we're 280 cap so we're not massive we've got a garden out the back which has got a 700 cap outdoor space um and we do a whole range of um, artist development work alongside our core live programming as well as providing free to access training programs for local young people to develop the skills they need to go into have careers and um, within back of house roles within live music so all of our in-house lighting engineers sound engineers event managers box office team have, have all come through that free to access program which is called soundcheck so yeah we'll be here today thanks for the opportunity thanks craig rachel Hi everyone, um, my name's Rachel and I'm from the Snug uh, Coffee House in Allerton, which is Greater Manchester but also comes under Wigan. Um, so I've been operating that venue now for eight years. Um, it started off as just a um, small coffee shop with putting acoustic acts on and then it, we, we just grew and grew from there. Um, you may have heard us about us more recently because we've become the first venue that's been purchased um, in, under the music venue properties. So uh, we're the first of, of many, <laughs> um, hopefully. So um, we've been on quite a few um, news reports recently and um, there's quite a lot of stories about us if you, if you Google the snug. Um, so um, we're quite small, we're 100 cap. Um, we've got quite a few people doing apprenticeships in digital marketing and sound engineering and things like that. Um, and we do, we put music on uh, Fridays, Saturdays, we also got an early doors project where we work with three other venues, um, one's a church, a coffee shop, and um, like a cocktail bar. So we put um, events on there, which has been funded by the UK SBF um, through the local council. Beautiful, thank you. And hi, Nathan. Hi, and for those that don't know me, I'm Nathan from the Brood Now. Um, I think we um, hold capitalist ideals at heart uh, use pay to play as a as a form of 
um, major kind of role in the artist sector. We charge 80% merch fees and we use dynamic pricing. Um, just some of the subjects are actually at grassroots and, and at the levels that we work at that actually most of the venues don't do. I think we hold real life tangible connections with um, artists, people coming through the talent pipeline and on and off stage talent and I think that we frame that and try and make sure that we sit in the best place um, to deliver those and support the artistic community around it, whether it is uh, graphic design, um, bringing through new talent that will go on to other pathways. So if you look at it where two or three of our um, former employees, one of them is now the European market manager for Secret the Group, another one is uh, currently out uh, as tour managing either for Dua Lipa, Florence and the Machine, and others like that. So we can target those um, and, and identify the pathways that go through, not only from the artists that came in the first place and seen gone through there, so if you look at Yard Act and, and English Teacher and others that have come through the venue, there's, there's a constant flow that is reinvested back into the wider music community. Um, that's about it, really. I think there's a lot else to say, but we'll probably get into that soon. Thank you. So I just want to go back to Quake really and, and just ask a bit more about artist development and kind of, well, you've all kind of touched on how the communities and like the communities of artists and audiences like impact your programme and how they're integral to your venue. But I'd just like to hear a bit more about that um, and just like, yeah, talk a bit more about artist development first of all. Yeah, so I mean, artist development plays a, a key role in what we do at, at Future. We operate on a on a, a three pillar model. So heart and soul of everything that we do is our venues, our stage is the, the artists that we that we that we uh, that we program. Whether they're touring national international artists or providing that kind of safe support and space for emerging new talents. But alongside that, we have two supporting elements and two supporting pillars. One around skills and learning. So our sound check program that I mentioned before and providing those opportunities for young people to develop the skills so that they can go on and have those careers within the sector from more of a back of house point of view but then thirdly artist development is absolutely at the heart of that and when you think about it if you think about the community of people that kind of coalesces around live venue in terms of the artists the audiences coming to shows the the, the touring professionals that come through that if you think about the community of people around the skills and training program the experts the talent the young people who are energized by that and then put artists and an artist development approach and an incubator program in the middle of that community it creates creates a really really dynamic new kind of community of people especially in a place like Birkenhead so where we are we're not in the middle of a metropolitan city centre um, you know Birkenhead like many northern towns has, has suffered you know greatly from underinvestment with a huge amount of kind of um, social deprivation and, and high high levels of poverty so an organisation like Future Art or any kind of community music venue plays a really, really key role in kind of painting the picture of what the possible might be for local people who live there, but also reimagining what Birkenhead means in the world to people from the outside. Like, anyone in here, put your hand up if you have heard of Birkenhead. Right. Keep your hands in the air for the people who've heard of Birkenhead. To bring your hand down if you, uh, if you, if you, if you think that it's a really positive, exciting, vibrant place. I was unloaded. <laughs> so you all thinking shit. <laughs> but I'm, paying, I'm making a point that it's not a place that means something hugely positive in the popular consciousness. And I think the work of, of, of Future Yard and all the community organisations, a lot of those that are kind of culture led, can really, really you know, change that and move that on. Um, and working with and developing and supporting new talent, whether that's on the stage or off it through our incubator programme, is, 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 is at the heart of that approach. So. You know, when I talk about a community music venue, um, we're obviously a CIC, so we're constituted as a non-profit, but that, 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 that approach to artist development really, for me, is at the heart of the model. Yeah. Do, you have to, do you have to be from the local area to get involved, or do you do things kind of focused on a wider scale? No, we do things on a wider scale. We, we try and do as much as we can face-to-face. -face. Obviously, when we, we, we only opened in the middle of COVID, so we put the keys to the building in January 2020, which was impeccable, impeccable timing. Um, so we, we started, when we started to, um, with our propeller program, which is our artist development program, um, a lot of that through necessity was on was online, 
but um, we do try and do as much as possible face to face, but blend that with a with with a mix of kind of online activity as well. So yeah, people, we do have artists from outside the area that regularly engage with it and take advantage of our mentoring opportunities and access the workshops and the masterclasses. Um, we actually built an artist dashboard during COVID, which allows artists to track key metrics and kind of outputs. And but each has their own kind of development plan, which they'll develop alongside the mentor. Um, so you can access a lot of that digitally and remotely. But um, yeah, we, we we really want to try and focus our impact in everything we do within a community that really, really, really needs it. And that area directly in and around the venue is in, it's one of the when it's measured through indices of multiple deprivation, it's one of the most deprived parts of the country. We're in one of the, the poorest, most challenging wards in the UK. Um, so really, really having a you know a laser focus on trying to concentrate on impact in those areas of acute need is, is really at the heart of what we, what we do. Nathan, I'm just gonna pass over to you because you talk, touched on in your introduction about the community around you and like how it's grown and you know, the artist community and the, the things you support. And I just wanted you to say a bit more about that and like, how that's built up from kind of the start of food now. And touching on what Craig said there, I think the not just the social impact, mm. the the economic impact that you have had on Birkenhead and the focus that the music venue will have brought nationally to that area will have brought a huge soft power output for the region, right? Yeah, so the, the, there's a lot more than just the <laughs> scalable economics that may be someone some metrics might might come across and i think that happens in every area if you take those hubs out you can always pick them up and put them somewhere else but the time and cost to redo that and an investment it's going to do to make that there and the loss of talent and as, and as i was saying isn't just talent on stage it's the the physical talent buyer the person who spots it the person who curates the area um, the people that make it happen. If you don't have the opportunities, the long tail economy that can come from that starts to, you know, dwindle. So, so you'll see that in towns, and that's why places like bath malls clothing closing are going to be quite significant because you look at it in those towns and you go, where do those people go? What 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 signal does that say? So, on a on a kind of national level, we need to look at what the importance of grassroots music and the access points and the, and the doorways that they give for the whole spectrum of the, the music community and how it engages not only within the music community but beyond that. So I keep making, whenever I do these kind of things, the analogies of how music influences other art forms that necessarily are not picked upon in a tangible, relatable thing. So if you look at fashion right and and I, I made this example to steve lamack the other day as well that we, i was sat with dave simpson from the guardian when they the, the thing came out and he was sat there with a pretty green uh, jacket on right and i said that label would not have existed if it weren't for liam gallagher and therefore you look at how do we ever measure on the investment that should come from certain other sectors about the influence that music and the creation that happens towards that. Whether we look at the goth movement in Leeds that goes on to the fashion that happened following it or, you know, um, the grunge movement that happened and you saw in Topman, Burr and, and other shops later on, those fine aspects have got to be somehow tangibly linked back so that we can quantify and get more investment in that we don't lose those and that impact that happens to communities because that's the missing bit about how the impact of an artist and someone else can bring and the value that that can bring to their communities as well as all the things that we shout about all the time about why it's important about the mental health the accessible kind of opportunities that we give the opening up of spaces for but for other events, not just music, but the, 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 the things that they bring with it. And I think that the, it is the education also, because I sit there and I look at faces in the audience and I go, without their local music venue, would they be sat here now or would they be sat in the role that they had? They're the questions that I go and I go, it, it impacts employment, not just in the sector, but outside of it. Whether it is you know law, accounting, so much that comes through it so i think that 
Um, that kind of spidergram needs closer looking at further from a community point of view and I've probably gone off on, on various uh, pathways but I think it does all link back to the community because unless you've got that at the start, Pretty Green doesn't exist. And that would be a sad will. Um, yeah, I totally agree about the role of music. The, the example there is, you know, Oasis got signed at uh, King Tut's. Yeah. So, so you link it back to that and, yeah. and, and Alan McGee and Creation Records and X, Y and Z. That's, that's the kind of thing that you look at. Now you've got a fashion brand that's selling in major cities that's paying business rates with stores that are there and X, Y and Z on a high street, right? So how do we set that in motion to explain that to uh, a national government and treasury that then is going to uh, give us a tax subsidy to reinvest in ourselves and make better communities? that actually do it for places like Ipswich and Norwich where there isn't a major arena and we can spread the uh, the catalyst that happened and the template that happened in Birkenhead to further parts of the country. Can I just show you You're absolutely right. I think if you look, use that analogy um, around being a catalyst and around that kind of value that's created, I mean, Birkenhead is certainly we're, we're we're very 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 early in that journey. But if you look at if you look at the brood now, if you look at LS six, you look at what that means and what that means now compared to what that was 20, 30, 40 years ago, and the, and the social value that can be calculated through that as well as the, as well as the economic one, which you know, we often take as, take as a given. If you can, the, tr the trick that I've kind of come to, well, the thing I've come to realize is that. We all get, we're all very, very good at kind of like singing the praises of our particular sector and why it's valuable and why it's important for the reasons that Nathan's very articulately kind of outlined. I think the challenge is to make sure that we articulate that in a way and in a language that actually the people that we're trying to convince it makes sense to, and we're solving their problems. So if you, th if you, if you think about um, social value, for instance, the social value that's created as a result of all of those communities of people that are coalescing around those venues and in those spaces, local authorities have got a constituted responsibility to boost that and a tangible kind of um, um, statistical way that they need to do that. If we can understand that and articulate back, that back in, their, in their terms, then that will open up different ways of providing funding into these organisations to make them sustainable. So sometimes it is about thinking about what we do in a different way, framing it in a different way, and thinking about, okay, rather than me going to war with that local authority, we've got a great relationship with our local council, and there's not that many music venues around the country that have that. Most commonly, they're quite adversarial relationships. But if you can, if you can, if you can convince them that you're not a problem, you're actually solving their problems, the benefits for that just make it easy for you to do your job and, and, and put on great shows and support artists and do the things that we want to do. That's that's the challenge that we've that we've that we've that we've got at the moment. I was wondering a bit about if Rachel could talk a bit about the music venues trust role, like because um, obviously that's your part of their sort of scheme now. But I just talk from advocates for venues and like making that case. Like I wondered if that's been a journey you've gone on with with the um, with the snug. Yeah. So um, just obviously making it really clear how important we are in our community. Um, we've. <laughs> It's hard to measure that, um, but the threat of, of losing our venue meant that there wouldn't be another music venue, grassroots music venue, for 20 mile radius. So th there isn't anything. There's, there's um, so to, to make that case, obviously, clear to the music venue trust um, that we needed saving um, was really important. There was nine venues altogether, um, and we were lucky enough to be to be the first one, so we're we're quite like the guinea pig, really. So um, <laughs> we've we've been through a lot, um, and we've got really good relationship with Music Venue Trust. Um, there's a lot of people involved in in making it happen. Um, so yeah, it's it, like I said before, it's just really hard to measure it. It's just the impact that it has. Brilliant. I mean, it's such a great it's, it's such a great story, and it's amazing that the venue's been saved. So yeah, um, so. Uh, has that changed anything for the venue and how it operates, or is it just kind of business as usual? Yeah, it's, it's very much business as usual. Um, so we was obviously really happy that that happened. It was a really great um, time for us, um, but we're still facing the same issues as, as all the other music venues. Um, still facing like the cost of living crisis. So now we've got this cultural lease um, for like 15 years. 
you know the pressure's on, I've got to make sure this works for 15 years. <laughs> so just, just to come in there, I think, I think the example there, to, to simplify it for everyone, one of the inherent problems that, that I personally don't face, but I know the others do, is that the properties, a lot of the time, the bricks and mortar that sit in there are not owned by the music venue. They are owned by a private landlord who, at the end of a lease, or, or should, you know, if it comes under the Land and Tenants Act or anything else, uh, the, the insecurity of being, a, of, a, of being a venue owner and thinking, should I invest in that property? Should I upgrade the PA and light? Should I put something else into it? With the insecurity of not knowing the future is where the balance lies. And Music Venue Trust have aimed in its first focus, the reason it set up was to try and ensure that grassroots music venues own their own spaces so that they could provide security, not only for the venue itself, but for its future planning and then allow investment to come in and have a considerate understanding landlord that that understands the nature of the, the business and can think as well about what is coming next, whether it is um, business rates and can advocate on behalf of the sector for, for those kind of aspects and lobby for um, you know certain specific tax subsidies under a certain capacity. So there, is, there are um, specific things that come with that model that make it a positive change than what we've ever had before. We're probably quite unique, aren't we, in the fact that there's three venues sat here which are in the, what is it, six, seven percent in the country of venues that actually that own their own, that own, their own building. Um, whereas CIC, so the, the non-profit CIC, owns the building, but um, yeah, there's not. There wouldn't be many panels representing grassroots music venues where the three venues that are represented actually own their own, own their own building. We were just having a chat um, about like business models before this started, about like your business model is really good, well, especially with the kind of the, the feeder program you've got, Propeller was it? No, and, and the, the incubator, the skills, the like backstage roles and things like that. So it's just interesting just hearing you talk and, and obviously making that point about um, the venues all being owned, that's really, really, yeah, I hadn't realised that actually. So um, I'm going to switch tack to that actually, because we're on a venue about Northern Panels, and I just, sorry, Northern Venues, and I just wanted to ask like the panel to throw it over to you all, like what are the like sort of like the benefits and the challenges of being a venue in the North in this day and age? Um, yeah, so we just sit outside of Manchester city centre, so we do find it hard to get any touring bands to come to our venue. Um, so most bands that we have are um, they they're not often on a tour; they are just doing like one-off gigs. Um, I sort of say we're a bit more like grass seeds venue than grass roots. <laughs> we're, we're we're quite a bit smaller than these these other venues. Um, so um, the, yeah, the struggles we face there is getting people the footfall, getting people to, to travel to the town as well. So there's a lot of transport issues, um, which obviously happens all over <laughs> all over the country. But um, yeah, so I'm always campaigning for better bus services. So you've, you've got to be spinning a lot of plates as well to, to try and get people to your venue. Um, and then a lot of people are driving, so that affects your alcohol sales. Um, we really struggle to get people to come and watch a band that they've never heard of, so all the promoting side of it is, is quite difficult. Um, I've got someone who's my event manager, but he also does the digital marketing, so quite often all the members of staff have got multiple jobs. You've got to adapt and, and yeah, change, get, learn, learn new skills. Um, so yeah, my, sorry, my event manager, digital marketing, is always, also the same engineer. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we've all got lots, lots of different roles. Multi-captain. So are you? Um, do you work with local promoters as well as promoting in-house? No, we, it's mainly just all in-house promoting. Yeah. And yeah. do you have? Do, do our agents quite like? Do you, yeah. How do you work with agents? Like, are they kind of like receptive to sort of like the one-off plays and things like that? Yeah, or? yeah. We, so we have like takeovers as well. We've got like a couple of record labels that'll do a takeover, um, and they'll program the evening then. Um, so we, yeah, we, we enjoy doing that, but we also work with other venues. So we sort of created three more grassroots music venues through um, a project called the Early Doors Club. 
So um, we basically got some funding which allowed us to um, build a stage and get the sound equipment, speakers, sound desk, everything like that, into three other venues. Um, and they're all they're all very different. So we're also like, um, we've got a church. So we've, obviously when we put something on in the church, it's only like, um, well, we couldn't put a full band in there with, with a big drum kit or anything like that. So, <laughs> um, and then we've got like a little cocktail bar. Um, and the other one is a coffee shop, but we do like spoken word and things like that. So it's, yeah, we're, we're involved in a lot of different um, genres and yeah, but it's, it's usually just people at the very early stages. Um, and, and it's great to have that kind of like flexibility with the different spaces and the different mm -hmm. types of music and stuff. I'll give an opportunity, not an opportunity, a benefit. And I can only give it from Leeds here. We don't have a multinational operator in the city. We don't have a live nation owned venue. Well, we do, we have the academy and we have the arena, which is SMG, but we don't, they don't have an academy two or three in there, which if you look at Leicester, Bristol, and some of the other places where they then route them into their own academies to get the bar sales that agents then force because of festival lineups to do that. What Leeds has done, successfully over the past couple of decades is managed to keep a collective of, of independent venues and people may think that you compete at times but actually making each other better and staying as an independent unit puts a barrier to entry to the multinationals coming in because they see the market is secure from doing that so if you apply collective rules from doing that you then ensure your own survival from those. So I, I sit there and, and part of that allows us to get great shows of underplays and bringing great talent to my venue and other venues alongside it because the multinationals haven't done that. And whether it is, you know, the, uh, Academy Music Group or the old Barfly network that happened there, I think that we, we collectively have ensured that that stability, and then we've taken advantage of those opportunities of, of, at each time that we can to maintain that the not only the venues are independent, but the promotion network is, is independent. And since the arenas come into Leeds, you have seen that um, multinational operator start to focus at a lower level <laughs> to buy the talent at an easier time so they can. Uh, you know, grow it and see that the one in twenty might go on to play an arena in five years' time and get the, get the, um, get the the financial recompense from their investment. And that trajectory is sped up with technological advancement even more. So if you look at someone like Noah Khan that just had a number one album and is, went from playing the venue behind us only back in what <coughs> October or something and played the arena. A week ago, so he's gone from one thousand to fourteen thousand. That that's the speed of that for a venue and for an artist and everything else. What technological development has had. So so you've got to be adaptable and agile on that. And that's why I say, an independent side, we are the entrepreneurial spirit and have that ag agility to be able to flex. Like uh, you know. Um, if you if you give a different analogy here that live nation are an oil tanker and for them to turn and swivel and pivot and get somewhere else in the changing nature of a storm that's going to take a while where the little speed boats that can get round and get through that and, and can independently change our nature of business and working and, uh, and flexibility and so therefore if you're wise about it you, you can have a successful place, you can work with the agents to go, what can we give you at this time? What what festival lineup's being announced that doesn't have, have an exclusivity on it and how can we get it in there? Is there a deal to be done on other aspects? Do we need a merch, merch rate concession? That's why I brought all those factors in because we're not the ones influencing dynamic pricing, we're not the ones influencing 15% merch levies like other venues that we shan't name do. The, there are those, uh, and you know, the, the original types of pay to play and things like that that came through the old networks that, that were set up. Um, 
So I think that being independent, being in the north, and also not being in London where on a promoter level as well as a venue where you have to work with that, you haven't got several promoters trying to come at you, whoever it may be, trying to get the lowest deal and bargain you down at the same time because there's a glut of artists wanting to play and they need your space, but there is also that threat of several other venues around you that they can put them into. So the competitive analysis is going, well, up north, we, if we stay united, then at least we have some opportunities for strengthening, strengthening our position in the long term. Okay, thank you. How about you, Craig? Um, yeah, I mean, I just just to echo what they just said there, I think that that um, that situation that you have in Leeds is, is really unique in a major in a major city, and you know, for the um, younger members of the audience, people who are artists who are developing and kind of like finding their path through uh, through this this murky world, um, you're in an amazing city to do that because that, that then drips through then into the artist culture, the creative culture, the you know the amazing. Um, uh, independent record label movement that leads us always out the zine culture it's always uh, that's part of the same the same ecosystem so yeah definitely cherish and embrace that i mean from our point of view in in Birkenhead, i think there's a there's a couple of um sort of challenges realities whether they're related to us being northern or just our own individual geography i don't know i think um we transport was a big big thing um so we've got a, a river smack bang kind of like the cuts through the middle of what is the city we're basically on the the left bank of the mersey since liverpool city centers on the on the on the right bank uh up until midnight we got three underground stations that were within a two minute walk of the of the venue brilliant tunnel links with the bus station over the road up until very recently after midnight you couldn't get under the river all the public transport stopped even on friday and saturday night so we were having like members of our staff after shows paying 60 quid in kind of like uber kind of surcharges um, sales charges to, to, to get home thankfully because of collective action and working together as a community working with the local authorities so they understand what we do and with our music board that we've got in liverpool we actually managed to lobby and get the night bus at the weekends reintroduced which starts just before christmas so that was the power of a music community again working collectively to, to bring about a wider change not necessarily about music but absolutely fundamental to making it viable for us to do the work that we do um, and I think the probably the other thing just to mention around geography is is uh, is um, we are still working in the way that we do with 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 agents and with you know that national network of agents and promoters of them really understanding the kind of geography north of Watford. So we've had some slightly hilarious instances where you know agents are like yeah put the show on sales great talk goes on there's a show in Chester and a show in Liverpool. It's like okay, you really don't understand that Birkenhead is literally half a mile from the <laughs> from the venue of the road. Thankfully, that doesn't happen too often. But you know, for us, what we try and do is play that to our advantage. So sometimes in some conversations, it's definitely a Birkenhead show where it's something that's being rooted through kind of like four fifth tier towns. So it might be us alongside Coventry and Middlesbrough, and Wrexham, and Bolsworth Street, but you know, places like that. And then other times, we're we're definitely a Liverpool show. Um, so yeah, it's trying to understand where you fit as an organisation and as a venue, uh, and having great, you know, mutually respectful and ongoing relationships with agents, which is you know. Just, just to come on to an opportunity that I think you've taken superbly, as a as a, a, a and, and and it comes onto geographical location, and when you talk about north, um, for all the deprivation in the north your venue and others have been able to access funds and finitely uh, use that within a business acumen to get some parts of levelling up or whatever else funding have come into combined authorities or other areas and taken advantage of that because the community is deprived to make it better in the long term. We understand the aims but there also needs to be a a realistic strategy out there to make that happen. It isn't all just nice fairy dust and all the niceties that we talk about social cohesion. We need to go about it in a realistic way that makes it say, hey, there is this uh, funding over there and it is targeted at our area and if we're not wise about it, it's gonna go to something else, right? Yeah. So, so what you've done in doing that and in the next stages that are planned there has been quite intelligent and I think that it's led a model that others should look to and 
we should be, you know, banging the drum more about leveling up and, and other areas in North because that's going to be our strength. If we don't use those those disadvantages to be our advantages in future, yeah. then it's our Achilles heel. We we need to use all those. So so the opportunity so so the negative points are coupled with the opportunity that we've got to see and certainly in the political landscape that we sit at the moment with a potential new government or not and uh, other aspects that have come because of the public sphere in the last five years over leveling up, it, it, it's meant that you have to take opportunities of, uh, at this time because in five years time it may not be there. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, thank you for the for the uh, <laughs> very, very kind words. I think that's really nice of you. Um, I think there's a it goes back to what I was saying before around understanding and trying to solve other people's problems. Now, sometimes I've had this conversation with some venue operators who are like, do you know what, I just want to put bands on. I just want to put bands on. I just want to put, I would, I'm, I'm in this because I want to put shows on. And that's absolutely sound, completely understandable, and I completely respect that position. But equally, if, if, if you're then going to acknowledge that your, your business model's facing real challenges, you, you know, the, the rise of cost of living and everything else means that it's, it's getting harder and harder and harder to do what you do, then fundamentally you either make a decision that you think about trying to finance it in a different way and embrace those opportunities and understand the political funding landscape and all those things, or you accept the fact that you're going to struggle and struggle and struggle. So I think it goes back to that idea of trying to understand and articulate what you do to solve other people's problems. And I do think this this isn't getting live streamed or anything, is it? No, we're not, are we? We're recording, yeah. right? Okay, so I think there's a delicious irony, right? I'm gonna share this with you. I think there was an there was an Alan McGee quote from back in the day about how um, he started creation with a with a basically a Tory entrepreneurship kind of um, loan, which had come through that. You know, I think I think I'm not wrong in saying that. So leveling up, let's all remember, was a conservative Boris Johnson policy. That's what it. That's what it is. That's what it was. That's where it's come from. So he's basically funded a radical grassroots live music venue in Birkenhead, which is a pursuing agenda to bring power and influence and wealth back to that community. He's done that on the proviso that he thinks there's some kind of Brexit kind of like votes out there. But really, when you look at it, let's use that money. Let's use that investment to improve the situation for local people, to improve you know the, the kind of context that we're operating, make live music venues sustainable, and then really. Everyone wins. Yeah. Thank you, Craig. Um, so I'm going to bring it back to artists now. Um, so I imagine there's probably some artists in the room, and I just wanted to ask the panel, like, if, if artists wanted to play your venue, like, how would they go about approaching you? Like, what would be the route in um, to play? Um, well, for us, people usually just contact us, um, either email or Facebook message, or we contact them we go out a lot to different venues um so it's quite easy to to get a, a, a gig with us really <laughs> um we'll do a little bit of a, a research on, on looking at the artist what kind of thing are you looking for for the snog um so we're trying to diversify our um programming at, at the moment um which we find really difficult because trying to get people through the door um again is is quite it's quite hard in Aberton. Um, we we are in one of the, the most deprived areas as well, um, and we did get some levelling up funding, which I believe um, it was to create um, free events to bridge a gap between five and eight. So it's quite um, it's quite a lot of criteria on it really. So by doing that, we're looking at for all all different kinds of acts. There's nothing. There's no set. Um, at that we're looking for. Um, in the month of March, we're showcasing all young bands, so it's all um, school and college bands that, that we've got, so we're trying to get a younger audience to come out. Um, we promote a lot of uh, low, low alcohol, um, all, yeah, alcohol free drinks as well, um, just to try and make it uh, that there's something for everybody. I mean, if someone wants to hand a brown envelope, <laughs> or if someone, I really like chocolate, right? So, you know, if, if some chocolate comes forward, they might find a band on a building number. Seriously, um, I think that, 
you have to get your house in order. There is a there is a point comes where and and again liken it to other things. And I think that the arts has and, and this is a discussion that probably needs have needs to be had more because at what point do you as a musician value your commodity and feel I should be playing that in front of people and for that value and what at what point if we're saying it's not pay to play it's, it's x y and z we need to reinvest in the sector if, if you talk about it sport if you go and play five side football you buy your boots you buy your shin pads you put your kit on you go down to one of the many national sports facilities with 3G turf and you pay five or eight pounds to play for an hour, right? That's the same in, in, in the arts as pay to play, right? And at what point do we say where we have a different model that we pay because of our cultural value that we see that and we see the talent pipeline that in future we will hopefully benefit from that that we can go on and make your career better and we can make sure that you grow at the same time. And, and that's part of where, where I went with that. And why I make this analogy is that, you know, realistically, lots of those players eh, who go and play five-a-side football are never going to go on to play in the Premier League. However, in live music, there is a, a, a good number of people that suddenly can put a single out and get it streamed x y and z and start to earn several different ways of financial recompense for their output you've got to be good at it right you've got to market it properly think about it in a business sense it isn't just an artistic output you've got to think about how you package it not just as in like what's on the on, on a sense but can you put it all into a hyperlink so no one's getting a lot of attach files how can you get it in front of someone how do you engage with the venue the promoter managers and everyone in that wide ecosphere um, and make sure that you make friends with the right artist band electronic artist whatever genre you're in and become part of that community i think it is about packaging it up but it is about at what point also you see your value and what is your perceived value and I also believe that at times you should say no to a show if you don't feel that the show is going to give you that value back there needs to be a level of self um, self-managing and plan behind it you know we can you talk about it as a music business and it's hard to say uh, do it for the love of it but want the financial recompense as well. And I think that you need both sides. It's a duality approach to it. So I, I think that it's, it is packaging it up. It is getting the right things. It is being part of the community. And, and there used to be things and, and Sam Whiskers, whoever else, uh, you know, when he was doing the shows, uh, promoting shows, we won't talk about when and how long back, but there, there were gig swaps that used to happen where one band would do it with a band in Sheffield and with a band in somewhere else, and they'd all go, and the, and the headline band from Sheffield might be on headlining in Leeds, but the Leeds band would be on second, and there'd be another opener in between, so everyone stuck around in between, and then they'd go and play in the other cities. And it's just, it is effort. It is creating your own opportunities, and then people seeing the value and thinking there's a buzz there around that. There's a, it, it's about being um, original, and I think that you can't sit on a one simplistic model to do that. But, it, but it's also thinking, at what point should I go and play that show? And at what size capacity should I play that show? Because there's no point someone coming who can pull three people into my venue because I guarantee when they play into an empty room, it's not going to be a great experience. However, if they can fill it, I'm going to be there with open arms and saying, I'm giving you chocolate, right? Um, I, I think there's a, there's a key key 
keep pointing in and Nathan's touched on around understanding your value as an artist. I mean, it was one thing that we saw a lot coming out of COVID is that, which is completely understandable, that, that a lot of artists were just playing constantly. There was this kind of like, you know, outpouring, which was like, we can, we can do this thing again. Um, and I think when you when you approach an event and you want to play in that space, or you want to play for that promoter, it's understandable. Well, put yourself in, in their shoes and what does it look like for them? So, you know, if you've got, if you want to do a headline show with us, but you've got three other shows within a in three week period, it, who's that working for? Is that is that working for, 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 for you in terms of, you know, being able to make sure that you're maximizing that opportunity in terms of the audience you bring into it? Probably not. Is it working for us as a venue? Probably not. But I think what you can do is try and develop a relationship with the venue which is a bit more authentic, which is pure, which isn't just purely transactional. So, you know, for instance, with Future Yard, we've got an artist development program there. Come and sign up for that, come and engage with those sessions, come to some gigs, come and meet the team, develop a relationship with us. I think it's better from an artist's point of view. If you identify five venues over the next six, 12 months, you definitely want to play and think, right, okay, I'm going to develop a relationship with those venues. And at some point in that relationship, we'll have a conversation about when it makes sense to do a show. And it might be that you do one, which is an opener, where there's no expectation for you to bring an audience, and that works for the venue because they've already, you know, that, that, that's already sold. That's fine, but it's a conversation based on a relationship rather than purely transactional. Um, you know, we try and keep it simple in terms of artists reaching out to play. So we've got a I want to play at future yard email address that people can get in touch with. But I'd always say. You know, sign up to the artist facing stuff that we're doing, come to our propeller sessions, meet the team, come to some shows, say hello, develop a relationship with us, and before long, you know, you'll probably end up with a, with, with the show that you, you, you want in time. Brilliant, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Can I, uh, can I, can I make a point that I think I, I meant to make, and that is I also feel there's a, a huge part of the education of the economics of live music that needs to happen not from those in venues or working as a promoter but from an artist i don't think it's taught very well within or uh, educational establishments because if i put it out there now and i go okay the moment a, a venue grows it it comes into tax brackets right vat x y and z and so we go okay, we're gonna put a 10 pound ticket on sale. Can anybody tell me just right now off the top of the head, how much that ticket goes back into everything else? Anybody? I can tell you it's seven pound something, right? Because you've got VAT off top, then you've got PRS on top of that. And then when you look at the other factors of that, that's seven pound something that goes towards splitting between an artist, paying for the venue hire, paying for the PA engineer, paying for the marketing of it. Everything that goes into a show, whether it's the beers on the bar, and then you're looking at it right now and you go, well, actually, within that, and, and, and the other side of it, when someone talks about profit, if somebody makes a profit, then that profit is also then subject to corporation tax at the end of the year. So whatever profit you make is then dependent on how much you make, 40% is going back to the treasury again. So it's already taken 20%. And then the smallest margin that you do make is going back then. So what, what, uh, people think it's a lot more um, affluent industry and certainly this level where the margins that you make based on a show are very small. And at the same time, when somebody talks about the reinvestment on a bar or anything else, it's like, well, who's paying for the public liability insurance? Because that's never on a costing sheet. An artist never looks at that and thinks, who's bought the fire extinguisher in the corner? Who's bought, who's put the bulbs up there? And you know when the microphone needs replacing, that's not on a costing sheet. They just look at it and think, there's 100 people in the room. We've got a £10 a ticket. There's a £1,000 there. But actually, there's a lot less. And who's replenishing that? And at what point, if we're talking about northern venues and this, at what point does the investment and acknowledgement that somebody has done to put into it get to where they take that back out and actually get some reward for the ingenuity, entrepreneurship and personal risk that they have put into that. That's part of what I think the education of an artist needs to happen. I think that side of it needs to be better educated across the board. And I think that 
once that happens, there's a lot more empathy of working with venues, working with promoters, because there's a better understanding and thinking, actually, is my ask for £250 to play for 30 minutes on a £10 ticket realistic when you see that at 100 capacity and you think that that, when you take out everything else and you think the yeah, sound engineer gets paid before anyone else and PRS and, and actually the first person that gets paid is the government and HMRC, right? So the last person to get paid is the one actually going out and going, hey, can you come into this venue and can you play a show and can we take the risk and we can give the platform and we can give the stage? They're the last ones to take it out. So I think there's a, there's a wider understanding, and we've only just touched on the tip of the iceberg there. So I think there's a, a, a massive amount of acknowledgement that needs to go as a handshake both ways. I uh, often say that the most well-paid artist on any of our bills are a band called here, Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Uh, I think it's really interesting what you were it saying is. about um, what you were saying about um, like awareness. Because um, I saw last week Middle Child Theatre in Hull have done um, a blog about like why they price their tickets like they do, and um, yeah, artist awareness definitely, but audience awareness as well, and just like knowing that like these are all the costs that goes into making this theatre show. And I think yeah, that, that could be something that venues kind of adopt and, and kind of have more like transparency about all those costs that you mentioned. I think that. <clears throat> there isn't a, 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 there isn't any will from anyone at either side to say everyone should be fairly paid, everyone should be rewarded for their time, everyone should be, you know, given the opportunity. It, it's it's the point of going well. Understand what comes with that, and that's that's part of what I think needs to actually happen, and from the audience because you know part of the time an audience never understands you know like like you can you can be positive about how uh, publishing and prs and everything else comes back and that's a, a really vital part because there's there's artists that make their career and living off the back of that and but but that's never really explained to an audience what i'd really love to see <clears throat> is when you buy a ticket it said one pound thirty-three off, and then the PRS off, and that's the bottom line, and that's what's going towards the show. That'd be beautiful, because it'd start to explain it, and it'd be coming to public consciousness, actually what is going towards paying for the show, but that's the work that we need to do. So there's a lot of education from both sides there. Yeah, totally. Well, I'm gonna throw it over to the floor now, so if anyone's got any questions, you wanna ask the panel. Um, do we have a microphone, Carl? Okay, so if anyone wants to ask any further, raise your hand now. Oh, got one over there. Jack in the box. Hi, guys. <laughs> um, just a question for Bacon Heads. Um, <laughs> I'll try my best. <laughs> so I come from Liverpool and I'm kind of like very aware of like the grassroots venues in Liverpool. Do you have a good relationship with the other venues like the Jacaranda and like the Zanzibar? Do you have to kind of coordinate with them if you want like a bigger Birkenhead show? Even though we've got like artists specifically coming out of Birkenhead like Zuzu and you know people who are a lot bigger. Um, yeah, it's probably the, the short the short answer. But in the same way that we would do if we were based in, in Liverpool City Centre, I mean, there's definitely been uh, a mixed reaction from some of the venues in Liverpool. Um, it's probably a diplomatic way of putting it. Um, but in you know in a really healthy kind of like mutually respectful, positive way. So Liverpool City Region has got a, a, a Liverpool Music Board which sits underneath our Metro Mayor which uh, I sit on and lots of the other venues kind of sit on that. It's quite a good dynamic group. So what that means is there's a, there's a, there's a good, honest forum for those conversations to, to have. And I think that's been really, really useful. I've definitely seen there's been a change over the last 10, 15, 20 years that the environment in Liverpool seems to be a lot more collaborative, collegiate, maybe a bit closer to the environment that Nathan was describing before in Leeds. Um, but yeah. There's still a huge attitude within Liverpool venues, Liverpool audiences. It's like, why would you go to Birkenhead? 
it's like we're you know 300 miles away but you know we see from our audience data that 50 percent of our audience actually comes to the river so sometimes those narratives and stories are actually quite useful because you'll play on them and talk on them as well and that, that in terms of how you tell your story thank you <laughs> Hello. Okay. Uh, how did you three all sort of get your starts? How did you originally come into ownership of your venues? How does that journey begin? Angel. Um, so um, I took on my venue um, on a it was obviously a, a private landlord. Um, and he wanted to sell the property. He uh, wanted to sell it during lockdown, but I managed to, to get him to extend that a bit. Um, and then, yeah, coming out of lockdown, he was giving me first refusal on it, but because of the impact of COVID on my, um, on my financial records, um, I couldn't get a commercial mortgage. So that's when I turned to Music Venue Trust, because they were just launching the, the new idea for the, the Music Venue properties. Um, so we went through that process and that was completed in October. So now we are officially safe forever. Nathan. Um, so, I mean, as I've mentioned before, I started after university in Leeds um, with the Rock and Roll Circus rehearsal rooms over in Armley, which I maxed out a credit card and bought it off the guy who had it before. That was it. So. Uh, and we started putting, obviously running it as a rehearsal space and putting shows on and, and kind of building that from there. Uh, I moved back to um, Liverpool in 2010 um, and um, ran a music magazine called Bido Lito, um, which we ran for 11 years, which was similar to Sandman, if anyone old enough in the room can remember the Sandman days. Um, and, uh, and ran Bido Lito, got very interested in music policy and the idea of a future art came from that, but basically, we originally rented it off a private landlord, the building. Um, COVID happened, and through COVID, we basically negotiated with the landlord. Um, got some social investment through um, an organization called Nesta, who invest in arts and cultural organizations that are trying to achieve social impact. Um, and we use that to, to buy the building, so the CIC owns the building. Um, so, you know, no rich benefactor, no nasty corporate in the background. I'm not a man of great wealth, might come to it. <laughs> I might not be a surprise, uh, if that's a surprise or whatever, but I'm not. Um, so yeah, that's how we did it. Um, saw the opportunity. The key, key thing was having that relationship with the local council really, really early on. So my conversations with Willowborough Council started six years before we found a venue about this, this thing that you can do with music. Music, like Future Yards founded on this fundamental idea and belief that music genuinely can change the world. That's why we get up in the morning. That's what we're trying to achieve. And how you articulate that and sell that dream to people who can make your life easier when you're trying to pursue that end is the key, 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 key thing. So we now are in a situation where our non-profit organization owns the bricks and mortar. We're there forever. We've managed to get Arts Council MPO last year and invest in the space so we can run the activity that we, that, that, that we run and put on the shows that we do. So it's completely doable for anyone is the point that I'm making. You don't have to come from wealth. You don't have to have some benefit to sat there. It's uh, understanding what it is you're trying to achieve, the problems that you're trying to solve, solve for other agencies and organisations, and knitting that together in a really, really compelling, cohesive and, and exciting way. I mean, complete accident. That's that's the honest truth. It, it, it was through um, the death of my father, various things like that and they they took on the venue in a financial uh, plight where an old bookkeeper when it was an old committee social club type of space had shredded all the accounts taken some money some VAT had come uh, up for payment and my father and, and, and mum were running it at the time and uh, they took their own savings to save the place um, what I'd say about that is and then and then move forward where that happened. I was studying uh, previous playing football and gone on to study at Leeds uh, University for an MBA and used part of that uh, strategy on the venue to look at the 
analysis of how I could effectively pass my masters, but thought this is an amazing opportunity here and it's in a great catchment and what can we do to alleviate but it, uh, what I would say there is you would have to be an absolute madman mad person sorry right now to invest in the music venue because it is the um, least lucrative side of the music industry where you are increasingly time poor above anything else and so the risk to reward alongside taking on a long-term lease or unless you've got a lot of money to go buy a building and have it freehold um, at which point you're probably a major property developer sat somewhere right and you're not going to be interested in the social economic impact and um, i think that it is just finding it, most people i know across the country who exist at our level have stumbled into it by no intention in the first place when you went into rock and roll circus you'd have never thought you'd have been back in birkenhead no, that's very true yeah, and i think there's true. never been there's not many people i know who've gone into it and going i'm going to open a music venue because that's the primary source they've opened it because there's additional income coming from other sources that might make them rich in the end I, I was just going to say that if I complete, completely agree and, and, and agree with what you're saying, I think it, I think it depends on what you, what it is you're trying to achieve. Because if you come into this endeavour to try and principally make money, uh, it's not the most effective way of achieving your end goal. It's probably a diplomatic way of putting it. But if you've got a real understanding of what it is you're trying to achieve, I mean, ours is to change that place. You know. I mean, there's one, there's one thing which is like, it's always a bit like letting the cow out of the bag, but a lot of the time, I mean, I'd, I'd say 70% of my time, the work that I do now, it's got actually got nothing to do with music. What it's about is about, is about place making, imagining people's, how we can impact positively on people's lives, how we can solve other people's problems. Uh, as much as I'd love to spend my days just booking bands, <laughs> I find myself the situation I find myself in, but yeah. It's been, it's I mean, the, the realistic what point of what I'm, I'm saying is, you'd probably with an amount of money be best being put into a high interest savings account and sitting there for five years and being oh, yeah. having a lot less uh, uh, enjoyment but but you'd come out of it a lot wealthier in the end it's just we're not really that interested in that we want to have a good time and see people smile and have make uh, changes to their lives right and see that someone's had a pretty shitty week but that show that they've been to has made them go out the next day. They might have a hangover, but they've had a, they've got a great hangover. And I think that uh, you know we can show the the the, the social impact that that has and the, and the color that we bring to people's lives and that everyone in that in that area does. We add the the, the like I say the color to to what would be an almost dull, uh, monotonous. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm really sorry, everyone. We've run out of time, so that's a really nice, um, nice place to leave it. Yeah, it's gone really great. Yeah, three minutes past. So I'm going to bring it to a close. But I just wanted to say thank you so much to all three of you for your insights and thoughts, and for yeah, sharing those with the audience. So thank you. serving lunch at the Rose Bowl atrium which is just across the road where you register or signed in and there should be volunteers around in case you need any help finding it yeah. and there'll be the second session starting here at 2 which is um, about North Talent Development.